Hi, welcome to On the Nose. I think I'm probably almost always going to start the episodes that way because that's how I feel. Welcome. I wanted to talk about drug shortages. I think that's what I'm going to start with, and then we'll see where I end up. Um, The ADHD medication Adderall has had a shortage since last year, starting in the third quarter, really, really hit hard fourth quarter. And there's been a fair amount of news on it, but there hasn't been enough change to fix it. Like, we're basically just expected to wait until, like, the issue corrects itself. The shortage is impacting, like, a lot of people. Um, Some people, it's like they just can't get their meds for, like, a week or something. But there are people like myself who have not been able to get their meds for six months now. I The last time I got a, a refill was in November. And it's been pretty difficult. I'll talk a little bit more about how that's impacted me later, but right now I'm just going to focus on the shortage itself. Amos just came over and is trying to get in my lap, so he's he's holding up at his end of the bargain by being a distraction. So the shortage is being caused by a couple of different things. There is a shortage of the materials that make the medication partially due to there being an actual like difficulty in getting them, but also because of like the way that pharmaceutical companies uh, plan stuff out, especially for generic drugs. They'll like only make like a, a certain amount and cut corners and whatnot to keep prices down. And so when the demand goes up, they're not able to keep up quickly enough. So that's that's part of it. But the demand went up about 10% very quickly because there's been a shift around mental illness in general where people are being a little bit more accepting about it. And at the same time, there has become an awareness that ADHD isn't something that just boys have and isn't something that people outgrow. It's actually something that can impact you for your entire life. So there are a lot of people who got diagnosis, like people like women who got their first diagnosis only in the last couple of years. And then there are people who had diagnosis when they were kids who are now realizing that the medication would benefit them. So this demand created a shortage. But the other part of this is that there are restrictions on how much of this medication can be made. There are restrictions on how many of the prescriptions can be filled. And that is implemented and enforced by the DEA. And it's their responsibility, because of this whole war on drugs nonsense, that they change, you know, like adapt. Uh, the numbers as as needed. So when the demand goes up, then in theory, they should be like adjusting what is permitted to allow people to get their meds. But the demand went up and the DEA basically refused to change the numbers. So the allowable amount of the drug to be made and the allowable prescriptions to be filled remained the same even though demand went up 10%. So while there is an actual shortage of the materials, which is playing a huge part of it, once that's fixed, which is supposed to be in the next few weeks, we're still going to be seeing a shortage caused by the bottleneck that the DEA has created. And the DEA has created this bottleneck because they think if they limit how much of the medication is out there, they can stop people from misusing it. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense to me at all. Like, you know, like if you want to solve a problem, let's look at the actual problem instead of the symptom. It just... Yeah. 
it's in, it's infuriating to me and and it's a big can of worms there's a lot of addiction in my family you know like my sister still lives on the on the streets and it it just <laughs> Amos has feelings too. <laughs> um, I just, I just don't agree with them. I don't think that like limiting the amount of medication for the people who need it is going to solve the addiction problem. Because if people really want to get drugs, they're just going to get drugs, right? And if and if they can't get them in legit ways, then they're going to get them in less safe ways. And this is proven every single day by people ODing from horribly mixed narcotics on the street. I'm not I'm not going to go into that too much because I feel like just based on the people that I know will be listening, it's a little bit of a preaching to the choir. Um, but I do fully support full legalization of all drugs and using the money from that to work on the real problems. But as we know, we don't live in a culture where people actually want to do the work to work on the problems or to change things. We just want somebody else to do it. So that's not going to happen. One of the things I stumbled on while reading about the Adderall shortage, because like once a week, I'll be like, oh, gosh, where are my meds? what's going on and look for updates um, was that, you know, there are other shortages that are happening and have been happening um, in, in higher frequencies in the last decade. Um, I, sh I should say higher and higher frequencies uh, in the last decade. And one of them that's gotten particularly bad in the last couple of months, especially is cancer medications. There's a shortage specifically on four medications um, they're all injectables, and m for the most part, the shortages are being caused by bureaucracy. Like uh, FDA has like certain things that have to happen, and those things aren't happening, and so you know the manufacturing isn't happening. I read a couple of articles that had like sort of different reasons for the shortages, but one of the ones I read specifically said that about fifty percent of the medications. Um, are made internationally and they have to get inspections done by the FDA before that they can make the meds and send them out and they're having issues getting those inspections done and so that would that would be a pretty major bottleneck right there if manufacturing just can't happen but it sounds like there are some other issues as well feeding into the shortage. So it's not just one thing. I'm going to include some some links with the podcast. So if you want to read more about these, uh, you totally can. So for me, how I've been impacted by the shortage. Um, I got my diagnosis about a year before the shortage. So I was only on the medication for about a year. And going on the medication was like being connected to myself in a way that I've never really been able to except in very specific moments. Like when I was on my motorcycle at the track and everything aligned just right, I would just have this feeling that I could actually think clearly and I could actually do the things that I wanted to do in my life. You know, and of course it only existed in that moment when I was on my motorcycle where I couldn't do anything else. But when I'm on the medication, it's very similar to that without any of the pressure to stay on the road. <laughs> but I felt like I was just starting to get to know myself. And after I started the medication is really when I started being creative. It's when I started making art. I started my shop. And since I've been off of the medication, I'm still making stuff for my shop, but I'm not making art as much. I just have a really hard time. The The medication, it, it, it like, what, I have pretty bad dopamine deficiency and the medication helps with that. It helps flood the brain with dopamine so that the sensors can actually get it because uh, it kind of gets one of the parts of ADHD that's not talked about is basically that people with ADHD often have dopamine 
deficiency issues because when the dopamine gets released in the brain, it doesn't reach the receptors. That is the word I wanted to use, or I said sensors, but receptor was the word I wanted. So people with ADHD will end up with dopamine deficiency. And it's really hard to do stuff if you're not getting the dopamine that motivates you and kind of helps train you to want to do things. It's one of the reasons why people with ADHD work so well with deadlines and stuff is because it creates the stress and the stress hormones kind of do the same thing as the dopamine. It's just not as healthy and it doesn't feel as good. But, you know, when you work on something that you really, in theory, should enjoy and it just feels like a cardboard box that you're chewing on, it sucks, you know. And with the meds, I just... I just experienced that so much less. I was able to do things like wash the dishes and feel like I did something because I got the dopamine. And I'm in my middle ages, I'm in my 40s, and these issues with ADHD tend to get a lot worse for women during the perimenopause, menopause stage of life because of like all the hormone shifting and stuff like that. So I think like when I was younger, I didn't have as many issues. I definitely had issues, which I'll get into, but it wasn't as severe. I was still able to take care of things. But over the last couple of years, it had gotten to the point that like I could barely get up to do anything. And it was so frustrating because I didn't feel depressed. I just felt like I wasn't getting something I needed. And then when I was reading about the ADHD and the dopamine deficiency and stuff, I was like, that sounds a lot like me. And then the medication just right away, like within the first couple of weeks, I just felt better. And even when I went off of it, I had a couple of months where it was not as bad as it had been, but I've like slowly been sinking into this, this bleh, this puddle of bleh, uh, where the dopamine is difficult to achieve again. I think You know, I have some routines like I'll play Beat Sabers or exercise like dance a little bit and that can help me for a couple of hours. But I sometimes am too fatigued to do that. Um, And nothing else really hits the spot. It just, just doesn't. So I felt like I was in the first year of rediscovering myself, the first year of feeling like a person after almost a decade of just being incredibly sick. And then like years and years before that, or I never had the bandwidth to be creative because I was in survival mode. And then the meds got taken away. And it's been pretty hard. Like, it's like in the grand scheme of things, it's not... This, it's not that horrible. It's not as bad as not getting chemo meds, right? That's that's terrifying. People are dying because they're not getting meds. They're losing out on the opportunity to potentially get to go into remission and live a long time, you know, and not having my Adderall, it's just, it's just not as severe, but it's still really hard. And I can't imagine if I was working a job and then to have this tool, this... Um, adapting tool, you know, taken away, how hard that would be, you know, like, I'm just in my house all the time. So, you know, it could be like a lot worse, but I still feel like crap. And I still would really like my meds. And I am really looking forward to when they're available again, so I can get back on track and start making art and start figuring things out again. One of the things that happened when I went on my ADHD meds is I started seeing how much benefit I would have received from being on those medications, that medication. Um, Well, really those, because there's probably other medications in that class that would work for me. But um, how much I would have benefited younger years in my life. My words are all funky today, but... um, Like, there's just this constant disconnect that makes me super prone to making mistakes, being short-sighted, 
on my decision making, especially if I'm like stressed or it requires like a lot of research. Um, and in my younger years, it was a lot harder for me to sit my ass down and do the work. Even now, like, you know, like I'm looking into getting an RV and I've got a spreadsheet and I'm doing the research, but I'm doing it in like 10 minute increments because like I can't stay focused and it's frustrating. And I know that there's like probably information I should be looking into, but I can't freaking figure out what it is that I'm missing right now. And I feel like if I was on my meds, chances are like my my research would be a little bit more thorough and I would have gotten more done by now. So in my younger years, um, ADHD impacted me in a lot of ways that I just internalized as me not being good at those things or not being able to do those things or not fitting in. You know, um, I tended to blame trauma or growing up poor those things as well, which all those things play a role, right? But there are some things that I can clearly see now. Yeah, that was the ADHD. And if I had had the support and access to the tools, chances are I would have navigated those situations very differently. School, for example, I didn't finish school. I tested out in 10th grade. I cut school a lot. I was very bored. I spent a lot of time at the library instead of school. I would take tests and do really well on the test, but I couldn't do the homework. I just couldn't fucking be bothered unless I was really interested in the subject. And then I left. So I left school in 10th grade. And then I tried to go to the junior college and take classes there, but I couldn't really figure out how to navigate it. Um, to get financial assistance, there really wasn't anything available to me because I didn't have good grades and I didn't graduate. So I couldn't afford it. So I had to work to pay for it. And I couldn't, I couldn't do both. I've never been able to do both. I can only do like one thing at a time or I get totally burnt out like super fast. And that's probably the autism, but I don't think my ADHD helped very much. And the thing is, is when I do stuff, I do it really well. When I did take classes, I had a 4.0. When I do my job, I'm really good at my job and I'm usually doing my job plus some. And I like it that way. I'm going to drink some water. But being on the meds, feeling how my brain changed, and then looking back at the way that my brain was working when I was younger... All the risks I took, I drove like really fast. I was a really good driver. So of all the people to be driving too fast on the road, I was a good candidate for it. But, you know, I did all of these things because I needed the stimuli. And I got a lot of speeding tickets and lost my license at one point And just, you know, there's a lot of decisions that my ADHD probably didn't didn't do me any favors but it's mostly like I feel like I had a lot of potential for things that I couldn't navigate my way out of my brain to do and I didn't have the support structure from my family or anybody else to figure out how to do those things with my limitations. So, you know, and and that makes me sad. It's it's not that like I can't do things now, but I can't do those things. I'm not going to go to school and get a PhD now. Like I I don't see how I could possibly do that. I would love to have that and I would have loved to have had the opportunity to have done that work. You know, because I, I would have totally studied psychology if I had had the opportunity to do that. But like in my current life, if I went to school to get a degree, I wouldn't be done with that degree until I was like 60. And yeah, I could do that, but I don't want to. I don't want to spend the next however many years doing the work of going to school so that I can start a career then, later, 
You know, like I've worked so hard my entire life, just constantly without getting breaks and just bouncing from one stressful situation to another and one job to another and one living environment to another, just having so little stability. It's like all I want now is some kind of stability. You know, like I don't want to sign up for for like 10 years, 15 years of school because that feels like an instability to me. You know, I'm going to work with what I have now, use my life experiences up till now to build what it is that I want with what I have. Because I need a break. I really need like a period of my life to just be less, less survival mode, you know? And I, there are so many things that have fed into my life being the way that it is, not just like the ADHD. I just think that that didn't, that didn't help me like at all. You know, I don't think anybody was paying close enough attention to me when I was a kid to really notice or to help me or whatever. At one point, my stepmom tried to get some self-help books for dealing with teenagers, and she was like, none of them apply to you. You're not like these kids at all. And I think, like, if she was alive and I was to, like, talk to her about the autism, she would be like, holy shit, that's it. That's what it was that we were missing back then. But beyond that, I really, you know, even, like, teachers and stuff just kind of didn't really know what to do with me. As a matter of fact, like... I had like one teacher who took like a strong interest in me in 10th grade and she was definitely neurodivergent. She was like one of the weirdest people I've ever met. She was really awesome and she was really strict in her class and also really intolerant of people who like pressured other people to fit in. She was just like, no, you know, like the first day of class, she like showed off that she could, she was ambidextrous and could like write perfectly with both hands at the same time. And the left side was mirrored of the right side. It was really cool. And she was like, yeah, I don't, I don't put gas in my car. My husband does that for me. It's just something I don't do. You know, like just straight up, like she's got this quirk and that is the way it is. Like, I, I really liked her and she worked with me. I was like, I don't want to do the work that you're giving us. It's like, I'm like way ahead of that. And she actually like worked with me and she gave me like work that she gave the classes she taught, she taught at the junior college instead. And then the deal was I had to teach her how to use a computer in trade for her accommodating me basically. So I think she got the better end of the deal because I got more homework, but I don't know. It worked really well for me. And if I had had more teachers like that, I might've stayed in school. Her class was one of the only classes I didn't cut. Like 10th grade, I cut first, third, fifth. And then I came to school for second, fourth, and sixth. So, you know, second was was banned. Fourth was her class. And then sixth was a biology class. And I really, I really liked my biology teacher as well. He was a hard ass and he was mean to the popular kids. Um, and he told my stepdad after a physical altercation that resulted in my shoulder basically being separated um, that if he ever touched me again, nobody would find his body. And I mean, you know, <laughs> pretty cool. I, I needed a person like that in my life a lot sooner, honestly. But I, I remember at the time, I just felt shame and embarrassment. And like, I felt like such a burden and an inconvenience that he was even, like, that upset about the situation. But now, like, in retrospect, like, I'm like, yeah, that was really awesome because I needed, I needed somebody to stand up for me. I mean, I'm different, just enough different that I have to stand up for myself all the time. It just gets so tiring and it's really nice when other people can do it, too. I mean, it's, I, it's one of those things that I feel like we should do for each other. You know, just speak up, say something. Like, we should normalize that instead of normalizing being silent. Gosh. So I wanted to do a little bit of a follow-up on 
episodes seven and eight, which were about like the financial impacts of like health issues and then the stress and stuff that I'm going through because I was saying that I really want to work to the point that I'm or work to get it to the point that I'm okay, that I'm breaking even uh, in my current living situation. And now it looks like my current living situation is falling apart. The environment that I'm in is not particularly safe for my health, both physical or mental. And I am going to be looking at changing the living situation. Um, By the time this posts, it will probably have already happened unless I change the order of episodes, which I kind of thinking about doing actually. But I just want to say like, if you see my stuff on social media, like for my shop, my Patreon, you know anybody who might enjoy it or might be interested in what I'm doing, please share, please share. I am not going to do a GoFundMe. I'm not going to ask for donations. I want to trade. You know, I just, I need help. I really need the help. It feels awful to admit that, but I need the help. And when I say that I need help, what happens is people get all, well, I don't have any money and they get all like, you know, defensive And like, one, don't put that on me. And two, there's lots of ways to help. If you don't have money, if you can't support, I mean, my Patreon has a $2.50 tier, right? Like pretty much everybody I know, except for me and a couple other people can afford at minimum $2.50 a month, right? They just, they don't want to. And, And that's fine. They don't have to, but... I'm not asking like for a lot of money. I'm asking for lots of people to do a little bit so that it adds up. And if people can't afford to help with money, they can afford to help by sharing, by supporting me on social media, by looking for my stuff, going to my accounts and sharing, reposting, retweeting, sharing, whatever the word is for getting stuff out, you know, like that is kind of everything. I mean, it really is. And it helps like a lot and it means a lot to me. And that's what I'm asking for. I'm asking for support. I'm asking for it to feel like people care about the situation enough that they want to help me change the situation And then using the power that they have to do that by sharing my stuff. You know, help my business grow by sharing it. Would I love it if if all these people signed up for my Patreon? Yeah. Well, it would probably freak me out, honestly. But I would also love it. (laughs) But it's not what I expect. I'm not expecting that, like, at all. But it's so disappointing when I look... And there haven't been any shares for my shop. I'm not getting engagement on my shop account on TikTok and people aren't reposting. You know, I'm getting the most support on Twitter from people I just met like a week ago or two weeks ago who are like retweeting my stuff. Uh, I don't know how far that stuff's going, but like, I don't care. I see the retweet. I'm like, that's freaking awesome. So, you know... Right now, it would make a really big difference. So, like, lean in a little bit. Help me get there. And if you need the same, tell me. You know, we can't trust the algorithm to show us everybody's stuff. So, like, I don't assume that people aren't supporting because they don't care. I actually assume that people aren't supporting because they don't see my stuff. But when I do see people liking, but they don't comment and they don't, retweet or repost or whatever I'm like okay now I've noticed that you're not you're just liking which doesn't do anything for the algorithm but if I don't see any action then I just assume that the person never saw it to begin with because the algorithm is the algorithm I don't know like how you think about the algorithm 
uh, I'm going to say the algorithm, you know, like in general, even though they're all, they all have their own personalities. But I think about the algorithm as being like the ocean. There's this sort of core that moves in a very particular way that you can sort of predict but that core is also constantly being impacted by all of the bodies of water that are feeding into it and the winds and the boats and just, yeah, earthquakes and like everything. And I think the algorithm is very much like that, especially like TikTok. TikTok very much vibes like that for me. So like people will be like, oh, I think I'm like shadow banned or whatever. And I just, it's just... It's just the algorithm. Like, if people start behaving a certain way because content changes, you know, the algorithm shifts with that. And then they update the algorithm on a regular basis. And it's really obvious when that gets rolled out because everybody's views and stuff drop. And then it slowly builds back up to where it was before. Um, it's like the algorithm gets shifted and then it needs to kind of collect data again and get back on track. So as frustrating as it is for me to deal with the algorithm, which buries my stuff a lot, I, I kind of think of it as like I'm like on a raft in the ocean and I don't even have a paddle. I just really don't have control. You know, some people, they have power boats or sailboats. They, you know, they've been pushed far enough into the algorithm that they have more tools and just have a little more whatever. But in the end, they still only have so much control because it's the freaking ocean, right? And we are all, what's the word? I don't know what the word would be there, but we're all basically sort of adrift in, the, in these algorithms. And there's a lot of superstition around how the algorithms work and shadow banning and spam liking that I have seen absolutely no supporting evidence for. And I find it really interesting that people don't see the patterns that I see in how things work, you know, like spam liking, you know, the, the whole entire thing with spam liking is if you had a bot coming to your account and going through your account and liking your stuff at a super high speed, you're, you would get punished because the system recognizes that there's a bot doing bot things. And so then you would get shadow banned or whatever the, whatever the punishment is, you, you know, um, so that's the theory. And, and I'm sure that there's something like that in place, but somebody just coming to your account and liking a whole bunch of stuff and they're actually watching your stuff does not hurt your account. I've seen absolutely no proof that it does because like it, it just like, why would it, you know, it's really obvious that there's a human being going through your stuff, liking it. Why would you be punished for a person doing what the app is built to do? Like, it would be nice if people commented on occasion and didn't just like, just because it's nice to have the interaction. Uh, in my experience, when people have come through and quote unquote spam liked my stuff, they actually do it like every 10th like or whatever, they'll comment on, on something. I've never had anybody just straight up like all my stuff except on Instagram. And again, I don't think it hurts anything. It's just another little tiny little drop in the ocean of of like emphasis on my account, you know, for the algorithm. Like there are definitely some things that seem to be true, like posting a certain amount of times a day, spreading out your posts, things like that seem to have an impact and can, can matter. But for me, I tried doing that. And what happened is all of the engagement that I got got spread out on the posts. So it was like recommended that you post like three times a day. And so I would only get so many views and so many likes per post. And if I post just once a day, I get the same amount of engagement that I got on those three posts just on the one post. So I'm like, okay, I'll make the content. I'll make it last longer so I don't have to make more content. 
and still get the engagement. And that's how it's worked for me. But I do I have talked to people that it works differently for them. And even with like accounts that are really similar to mine, they will have very different experiences. Like there are people that have accounts and they have like 1200 followers, but they get like 600 likes consistently on their stuff. And I'm like, I get 50 likes and I have 6,000 followers. And it's just, we all end up in different places in, in the algorithm for one reason or another. Um, and I think sometimes it's totally random. And I think sometimes it's like the community that we've built ourselves into. So, you know, I, but I, you know, some things are less certain, which is why I kind of just go, well, I'm here for the ride and I'm going to enjoy what I, the engagement and the interactions that I get and not worry too much about the numbers. Like I kind of watch the numbers, but I don't go like, if the numbers are less one day, I'm not like, oh, I am the sad. My numbers are so low. I am shadow banned. Yeah, I just saw, I've, he, the only time I thought I might have been shadow banned is I got um, violations and I got three of them in two days because I was having issues with sounds. So I would upload a video. It would let me upload a video. And then when I posted it, like an hour later, it would be like, this sound isn't allowed, even though the sound was in the TikTok thing. And so I would appeal it and they would re reverse it. And this happened like several times. And then after that, I stopped getting my normal number of views for seven days. I was getting like 30 views and was like, okay. So I definitely felt like I was in the timeout box and it has been established on TikTok. If you get in trouble, even though you appeal it and they will reverse it, it still counts against you, which is kind of rude. I mean, that's like, like being a parent and being like, well, you annoyed me that one time. And even though I was the one being easily annoyed and what you're doing wasn't actually a problem, I'm still going to hold it against you. You know, it's kind of toxic. But anyway, I kind of like, I shifted, I shifted topics. And that's okay. That's okay. I'm going to, I'm going to leave it. You're going to get it. But I think that's it. I hope you guys have a good weekend and that you enjoyed listening. And if you have any questions or I don't know, things you want to hear me talk about or you have any comments, please send them to me. I don't care if you text them to me or put them here or email me. Uh, I do have an email address for the podcast. It's on Lynn knows all one word at Lee com. So L E I G H E. Dot com. So yeah, like you can contact me and let me know some things. Okay. <laughs>